session. Uh, as you know, the annual research workshop is an annual event organized to be able to coincide with the launch of the annual research bulletin. Uh, the bulletin itself will be uploaded onto our website at 11.30 this morning once the webinar is finished. So we hope that you will be able to refer to it afterwards. We're very happy to have with us today uh, from um, Francesco Fazzani from Queen Mary University of London. And we also have Germano Ruizzi, who is a research economist with the Central Bank of Malta. Um, uh, we will shortly pass over to Deputy Governor Sandro De Marco to do the introduction. But if I can just please clear up some of the usual housekeeping rules, I think by now uh, what we never even dreamt of a year ago has become quite standard practice. Can I please ask you to keep your microphones off. Um, also, since there are a number of speakers, if we could ask you to keep your cameras off unless you wish to make an intervention. We will be taking questions after um, both of the interventions. Uh, there'll be a, a good 15 minutes for questions and answers. You may either raise your hand in the meeting or just send a message within the Teams chat and either way I'll be able to pick them up from there. So uh, apart from that, please note that the meeting is being recorded. Our intention is to upload the recording onto the website once the meeting uh, is done. Usually it's, it's up within a few hours and that means that if there are any other of your colleagues who may be interested in it, you'd also of course be able to allow them to watch it at their convenience. So without further ado, uh, can I please introduce our first speaker, Sandro De Marco, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank. Sandro, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Good morning to all and uh, welcome to the fifth annual research workshop of the Central Bank of Malta. Unfortunately, due to the well-known circumstances we have been living over the past uh, nine months or so, we are uh, unable to meet physically. However, the, the developments in technology today allow us to overcome these barriers uh, created by, by the need for social distancing. And therefore, I would like to thank you for choosing to be with us uh, for this uh, workshop, despite uh, these difficulties. Uh, although the pandemic to some extent has put on uh, the brakes on migration, nevertheless, the, the phenomenon of migration is likely to continue not only in, in Malta, but uh, globally, for various reasons. On the one hand, migration is usually spared by conflict or economic factors, as people from uh, conflict areas or poorer countries or regions uh, travel to, to other more affluent countries in search of a better life. However, migration also occurs because of demographic factors, Population aging in many parts of the developed world also means that in the absence of migration, the working age population will shrink and this could give rise to labor shortages. Although in some cases, uh, this could be partly mitigated by further technological developments, particularly with the rise of artificial intelligence, which can take the jobs, uh, a number of jobs. Uh, therefore, given that the phenomenon of migration will remain with us uh, for, for quite some time, I would say, um, we decided to focus on this theme for this year's uh, workshop with two uh, presentations. The first presentation is entitled Border Policies and Unauthorized Flows, uh, Evidence from Refugee Crisis in Europe, which will be delivered by uh, Francesco Fasani, who I would like to thank uh, for accepting to contribute to this workshop. Francesco is an associate professor at the School of Economics and Finance at uh, Queen Mary University of London, which he joined in 2013. He has a PhD in economics from University College London and is also a research affiliate at the Center for Economic and Policy Research and a research fellow at Center for Research and Analysis of Migration and the Institute of Labour Economics. As his affiliations clearly suggest, Francesco's main research interests are in labor economics, applied uh, microeconometrics, and economics of migration and of crime. He has recently edited also a special issue on migration for labor economics and published a volume on immigration and crime with Cambridge University Press. He has acted as a consultant for the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, 
the International Organization for Migration and the World Bank. Francesco's presentation focuses on border enforcement in Europe and, and the flows of asylum seekers and, and migrants without a document of identification. It has elements of political economy by showing how border enforcement reacts to the political cycle in Europe. The last part of the paper looks at effects of outsourcing border controls to a non-EU transit country, specifically referring to the 2016 EU-Turkey deal on the terrorist and diversion of unauthorized migrant flows. The second presentation which we'll be having today is entitled An Assessment of the Macroeconomic Implications of Foreign Labour Supply Shocks in Malta by Germano Luisi, who is a senior research economist at the research department of the bank. Uh, Germano has a PhD from QMUL and his main research interests are in VAR modeling and Bayesian uh, econometrics. In his paper, uh, Germano develops a BVAR model to identify a number of shocks, including a domestic and foreign labor supply shock. He uses such a model to look at the impact of an immigration shock on GDP wages the participation rate and the, and the unemployment rate. Extensions to the model quantify the impact of migration shocks, immigration shocks on productivity, public finances and, and the housing market. And this research is published as a working paper and is available on the bank's website. Uh, during 2020, research by staff at the Central Bank of Malta essentially focused on 16s. Uh, first, we had a sectorial analysis and the changing structure of the Maltese economy, which has become increasingly important, especially with respect to the assessment of the pandemic and the policy implications related to this shock. Indeed, we will be dedicating more resources with external uh, collaboration for this kind of research over the, the coming two years. Uh, another strand of research focused on forecasting and uh, business cycle analysis, which remains as ever a challenging task, more so when economies are becoming more frequently hit uh, by severe shocks. Uh, thirdly, we focused also uh, on demographics and inequality, which is always an important topic as demographic developments as well as inequality issues tend to have important impacts uh, on both fiscal and monetary policy, given that they inevitably impact economic growth and prices. Uh, fourthly, um, the property sector and macro financial linkages, a topic which always attracts uh, particular interest, especially in, in, in Malta. Um, we have also um, delved into model development and use of data, which is always a constant, I would say, in, in our work. And finally, um, uh, we also went into fiscal and monetary policy analysis, which is, of course, at the heart of our business. I would like to, to take this opportunity to thank uh, our staff at the Economics Division for their sterling work in producing research work that makes the Central Bank of Malta, I would say, unfortunately, a solid resource of such kind of work in Malta. Over the past uh, seven years, we have seen a steady rise in, the, in research output at the bank. If we look at uh, 2013, we had around 15 productions of boxes, uh, working papers, policy notes, and external publications. By 2020, these have doubled without doubling our staff, of course, apart from uh, numerous presentations that our staff have, has delivered to external audiences. Our aim, of course, remains that of, of keeping the pace uh, of output for the benefit of, of, of society. As we have been doing in the past uh, two years, the annual research workshop provides us uh, today with the opportunity to present the third edition of the research bulletin, which uh, we encourage you all to read during your uh, free time. The four papers that we have included in this year's bulletin have been produced with the contribution of eight of our economists at the bank. These provide very interesting research about diverse topics. The latest bulletin essentially shows how our economists have been creative in complementing traditional model modeling strategies uh, with information from other techniques, building analysis from using alternative data sets, using in innovative data collection methods. These, together with research using more traditional survey methods and modeling techniques, provide 
interesting insights on, on, on the various issues uh, examined in these papers. I will only give you a very brief teaser of what these four papers included in the 2020 research bulletins are about, which hopefully is sufficient to convince you that they are worth the while of your precious time. Uh, the first article by Nathaniel De Bono, Ruben Ellul, and Brian McAuliffe deals with the construction of a hedonic index for private sector residential rental rates. One has to recall that while the NSO produces a residential real estate index uh, based on contracts, um, but without taking into account uh, quality or specific characteristics of residential units, there is to date no national index of residential rates. Um, uh, as you know, we, the, the NSO only publishes data on, uh, on, on property prices. This paper not only attempts to construct an index of residential rates, but one which also takes into account qualitative effects through the use of big data methods from publicly available sources. This database comprises almost 22,000 listings that span from the fourth quarter of 2017 to, to the first half of 2020. Uh, this approach helps to provide us with a good guide to the evolution of private sector rents, although uh, the usual caveats of advertised prices uh, apply, just as in the case of, of, of property prices. I will leave it up to you to read the paper and find out uh, the results of, of, of this good work. Uh, the second paper is by Noel Rapa, which deals with uh, an extension of the bank's uh, macroeconometric uh, model stream. Interestingly, this work was prompted by the questions that were being uh, uh, raised concerning the effects of the pandemic on the economy. As we all know, uh, while the pandemic is a common shock across all countries, however, its impact is not homogeneous across all sectors within each jurisdiction. Clearly, the containment uh, measures adopted meant that some sectors were impacted more than others, and some may have been impacted positively, positively at least in the, in the short term. One of the major weaknesses of our traditional models is that they are not uh, sufficiently detailed to differentiate between the impact on one sector from that uh, on another and therefore makes it very difficult to, to, to quantify the, the potential impact of the pandemic on, on output and employment. This paper seeks to address this shortcoming by using information from input-output uh, tables and calibrate the bank's model on the basis of such information to estimate the, the impact of various measures and assumptions. This uh, has helped us to, to, to create different scenarios for our projection exercise, for example, creating different paths based on varying assumptions related to the breadth and length of the, of the containment measures. Um, the third paper is a report on the results of the latest household finance and consumption survey for 2017 by uh, Valentina Tonaroli and Warren de Guara. This is a large scale survey held across, across Europe, uh, coordinated by DCB, involving some 91,000 households, including some 1,000 households from Malta alone. Uh, the paper compares the findings for Malta with those of other European countries participating in such a survey, which makes it particularly interesting. This is a very rich survey, it provides detailed information on, on households balance sheet, income flows, uh, wealth and expenditure, which is indeed uh, very useful for both economic research purposes and also for financial stability considerations. The results are indeed very interesting and, and in several aspects this suggests that Maltese households have strong balance sheets, um, being far less indebted than, than uh, other European counterparts, with a very favourable debt to asset uh, ratio and lower inequality in household net wealth when compared to the situation of households in other European countries, mostly reflecting essentially the strong home ownership bias we have in Malta. But uh, for more information and more results, uh, um, uh, you have to read more in the paper. Uh, last but not least, the final paper of uh, William Gattfenek and Germano Ruiz entitled Housing Demand Shocks, Foreign Labour Inflows and Consumption, proposes a VAR identification strategy based on the Maltese data to analyse the linkages between residential real estate prices, foreign labour inflows and household consumption. 
the model was applied to estimate the impact of two housing demand shocks, one originating domestically and another from abroad, and how these propagate through the different channels of transmission. The study essentially finds that both kinds of shocks play an important role on the evolution of residential real estate prices and household consumption, while only domestic shocks tend to impact mortgage credit. As I said earlier, I very much encourage you to read these very interesting papers and thank the authors and those who contributed with comments uh, to such uh, work. Well, I, I will now give the floor to our guest speaker, Francesco Fasani, who will talk about his work on border policies and, and, and unauthorized flow. So to you, the floor, Francesco. Thank you. So good <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And, uh, and many thanks for for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be to be here with you. I'm very pleased to to be followed also by by Germano Ruizzi, who is a former student of PhD student of Queen Mary University, which signals the this uh, collaboration between Queen Mary and the Central Bank of Malta, which we are very proud that uh, at the School of Economics and Finance at uh, Queen Mary. So today, I'm yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, I will present. Well, it's an academic paper on it's an, an empirical analysis of uh, of a few lessons we think uh, uh, me and my co-author Tommaso Frattini at the University of Milan think that can can be learned from uh, from what happened in Europe in the last few years in terms of uh, refugees, um, undocumented migrant flows, and what happened in terms of enforcement at the external borders of the European uh, Union. Um, just there will be some some econometric, some jargon involved, and I, I will try to. To, to keep it to, to the minimum, and um, but I'm really happy to take questions about it, and uh, so and so let me start sharing my my slides. Should be they should be visible right now. That's fine, Francesco. Yeah, Over perfect. to you. I'm here perfect. if you need us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So let me set my timer. Okay, so so as you said, so the, we're going to talk about border policies and now authorized flows, and then we clarify whether what these unauthorized flows, who are the the, the people who are inside these unauthorized flows, and uh, evidence from the refugee crisis in Europe. Joint work with uh, Tommaso Frattini from the University of Milan. So let me just introduce the the topic. I mean, Malta is a. I, I hope this uh, this work is relevant and for Malta, which is really at the, at the forefront of the external borders of the European Union and the close one of the closest country to 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 European member country to the source countries of this flow. So, uh, and um, so we there is a persistent increase in global population who is uh, forcibly displaced by usually by conflict, by social unrest, by and um, by wars, by civil wars. And uh, the current count the UNHCR makes is, is something close to, in 2019, something close to 80, so 79.5 million of individuals who have been forced to leave their homes the basically half of them, uh, actually more than half of them, are so-called IDPs, so internally displaced people, which means that they had to move their current, they had to move away, to run away from the current, uh, from the actual house, but they moved, they are still inside the country. Okay, so they just move within the same, the country of origin, but they moved away from the, well, where they usually lived before the conflict started. Then there are like a population of 26 million of refugees, and then, uh, and then something like 4.2 asylum seekers, which basically individuals who reached, so refugees and asylum seekers are both individuals who reach a, a foreign country, and uh, the asylum seekers are still basically waiting for an answer about whether they will be entitled to stay or not, and refugees instead are individuals who reach a foreign country, and a third country, and they were allowed to stay there. And then we have this new wave, which is now, uh, the UNHCR count them separately, and uh, which are Venezuelans abroad, which is now if, is the biggest population of refugees currently, which is 3.6 million of, of Venezuelans which have moved away from uh, from Venezuela. So this this graph shows this increase which have, which we have experienced starting from uh, from uh, relatively flat numbers in in 2009, 2010, 2011. Now this like fairly steep increase. What we need to know we need to know the well very briefly there are many things we would like to know about refugee flows, but some important information is that they they are highly the population of refugees is highly concentrated in terms of uh, 
of countries of origin. So 68% again in 2019, but this figure doesn't vary much over time. They tend to come from very few countries where there are major crises. And uh, Syria, Venezuela, currently Afghanistan, South Sudan and Myanmar, which I think suggests that potentially the, all the, the issues of refugee crisis could be tackled by thinking more about whether is it, is it possible to prevent conflict in this in this country. So, so it's not so widespread, let's say. And it's also concentrated in terms of, uh, of where they go. So, and this is something that uh, from a European point of view perspective sometimes is, uh, is misunderstood, but the vast majority, and uh, so 85% again in 2019 of, uh, of refugees remain in developing countries. Basically they move to, to neighboring or nearby countries. So it's the example of Syrian refugees and uh, where the largest fraction of them is actually in Lebanon and then and now in uh, in Turkey. And um, and uh, so only 16% reach high income countries and actually 27% of them are in the least developed countries. So the poorest country in the, in the world are actually, which is an important point to, to, to think about, the poorest country in the world, countries like Bangladesh, Chad, Ethiopia, Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, are hosting more than the high income countries, hosting more refugees than the high income countries uh, overall. So this is just like a background at the world level. Now just let's focus on Europe because clearly in Europe, the emphasis during the so-called refugee crisis 2015-2016, the, the perception was that all the refugees were coming to Europe. This is clearly not true if you look at the, at the global number, but is it true that, um, that for Europe, that the numbers that were received in terms of uh, asylum application, in terms of uh, crossings, which I will explain later, which are the number of people trying to enter Europe without uh, a legal visa, uh, these numbers were indeed unprecedented. Okay, so they are not they are not large. If you look at the if you take a global perspective, they are large for Europe, and therefore this very well explain why there was such a political. Um, Upheaval, upheaval uh, during the refugee, the so-called refugee crisis, and still now this uh, issue of migration and uh, refugee migration is very much on at the top of the political agenda in all in all countries. So clearly, so this is this graph shows like a little bit of the evolution. So the the, the blue line, the red line are asylum application and and crossings, and so with this peak in 2015, and this drop after that. Okay, we'll. And my presentation will talk about this this first part up to the to the peak, and then something happened um, uh, at the peak, which I will anticipate in a second is uh, is basically the, the the deal which was uh, signed by the European Union with Turkey to for Turkey to step in in stemming the flows, and and then this uh, this subsequent drop, and uh, so the numbers are large. There's also clearly all this uh, uh, topic is highly contentious. From a political point of view, from a, I would say also an ethical point of view, because clearly there are uh, tragedies involved every every day of migrants dying while attempting to cross. And uh, so my presentation will really try. I mean, I'm doing the job as an economist, so I'm trying to, to provide some evidence, some 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 data, basically some policy evaluation of the of the border crossing policies, and uh, and then for, for to provide some kind of like first evidence to 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 then develop a more informed debate. So what we do we in this paper, we, we, we study really the e European Union and the European Union response. And we think this is very interesting because um, Europe is expected to, to face strong migratory pressure in the future. So it's fairly clear that, for instance, US will not really be exposed by major migratory pressure in the future, despite what uh, so, so, uh, some politicians in the U.S. think clearly that the, the development in Latin America has reduced and demographic factors in Latin America have reduced the migratory pressure, while the opposite is true for Europe be, because of both of combined dem the demographic factors in Africa and Asia and instability and uh, in Africa and Asia, which will develop in the future even more migratory pressure. So we need to be to think about to be prepared. And uh, clearly, during the refugee crisis, there was uh, a rush to uh, an emphasis from a political point of view on closing borders. And then the the first 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 Europe tried to close border and deploy uh, operations to, to to prevent migrants from from coming in. And then there was an outsourcing of uh, of controls, which is uh, the collaboration which was started with Turkey and then uh, with Libya and other. Uh, 
uh, either source country or or transit countries like uh, like Turkey. Um, an EU agency, there is an EU agency in Europe, which is called Frontex, which is responsible for coordinating the enforcement at the external EU borders. But clearly, each individual member state retains its own sovereignty in uh, in in um, in uh, in dealing with my migratory flows, and uh, and so this is also there. So clearly, they they patrol their own national borders on top of. Uh, the action that are taken at the EU level. So clearly, I mean, any discussion, uh, even more so, I mean, any discussion at the European Union level clearly highlight the, the presence of conflicting and um, priorities, non-aligned priorities across member states. Clearly, it's it's a it's a you well, it's it's in the news today, and so clearly each member state have, has its own priorities, and and the European Union is trying to find a uh, find a consensus, which is not always easy, and there are these tensions in. Uh, in, which goes in different direction. And clearly on migration issues, this is fairly, I think, is fairly ev evident. So clearly each um, each country has its own vision and of what of what a desirable migration level is, which may be different from the vision of the European Union level. And clearly this may lead at the migration level um, um, so, some suboptimal outcomes. We will discuss it more, but basically the idea is that each country, whenever Europe is exposed to flows, uh, from of refugees or and uh, undocumented migrants, each country has a strong interest in reducing the flows which hits, which reaches their its own shores, and uh, and hoping potentially that these flows will either will not come or will be diverted towards other 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 countries. And clearly, this may be desir desirable from from the point of view, for instance, of Italy, if the flows get diverted towards either Spain or. Or Greece, but clearly this is suboptimal from uh, from the European Union as a whole. So this tension uh, may may generate this kind of behavior. And clearly, some institution of the European Union, such as the well, not, uh, such as the Dublin Convention, which basically, as as you as you know, it attributes the the responsibility of of uh, bearing the cost of uh, of hosting the the refugees to the country which first received the refugees. Uh, clearly generates incentives for opportunistic behavior. So if, if the refugees don't enter my country as first country, I'm not responsible for them. So I, I'd rather have them entering European Union from some other path rather than going through my country. And so this will be the, the, the elements that we, we have in this, uh, I will bring to the analysis. So there are three st steps which I will try to do in, uh, in my time. And it's a long presentation. I will try to, 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 to convey the main message. So the first one, we will uh, document the evidence of political cycle and enforcement. So what does it mean? It means that we, we will show that the enforcement, which in theory should react only to, to expected flows. So I deploy more, uh, uh, more forces, more, more patrolling in, uh, on routes in areas where I expect more flows. But we will show that there is a political cycle, meaning that this enforcement will change depending on political factors which have nothing to do with, uh, with migration. And just to anticipate the the econometrics behind it, uh, we will use this as a as an instrument and as an instrumental variable in our identification strategy. Then we go to actually estimating the causal effect of enforcement on migrant flows. So this may sound a, kind of a silly question in the sense that we basically ask the simple question whether uh, deploying more more enforcement on the on the borders leads to lower flows or not. It's not such a silly question because it's First of all, there is very little evaluation. So it's a policy evaluation question. Do this uh, uh, policy, do the, does this investment in border enforcement works and to, to which extent and which are the, the overall effects? So and this question has not been answered very well in the literature because of a number of issues that I don't have time today, which has to do with measurement and uh, identification. The econometrics behind it is not, is not straightforward. And so we try to give our answer. And then finally, we study, we look at the outsourcing. So as I said, after in 2000, uh, after 2015, the, the new trend, let's say, in EU uh, migration policy was that of outsourcing. So, so uh, asking transit countries to, to step in, in stemming these flows. So the contribution, as I said, is really, you should think of, I, I also work on crime and just to, to make a parallel, um, uh, the area of like evaluation of the effectiveness of police in reducing crime has been widely explored by by economists and other quantitative uh, social scientists. But on border enforcement, there is very little evidence. Very, and uh, so there is some work on the U.S. 
and uh, but it's very few papers, some of them really good, but very few. And then there is now obviously a wave of papers, basically, as you can see, all from basically 2018, none of them published yet. So a wave, I mean, clearly researchers are stepping into this uh, this area because it, clearly the, the refugee crisis in Europe uh, in, induced the, the, the well, attracted lots of attention, but still, there are maybe four papers plus another one I have. So it's, it's really a small area compared to how much money and political investment is made on, on border enforcement. So, so let me go to the, to, let me first present the data so that maybe clearly whenever we want to talk uh, uh, about issues like border enforcement and illegal migration, the main challenge for uh, an economist, a quantitative economist is uh, is a data challenge. Clearly, these are phenomena which are hard to measure. And if you want to say something and use uh, some uh, statistics, some econometrics, we really need to have data. So this is one of the uh, main major hurdle to, to the development of, of a good policy evaluation of these uh, border enforcement policies. So let me just present the data, because basically the data a little bit determine what we can do and what we cannot do. So the data we use is, um, so the outcome Outcome that the variable we will try to explain is illegal border crossings. So these are so basically we so what are they? These are data collected by Frontex, which collects data from all member countries about how many uh, uh, individuals. So the definition is like third country national who were detected when attempting to enter illegally the European Union at the external borders. Okay, so this is the, well, I don't need to, to tell you. So the, the gray area is the is the European Union and this uh, and, the, and the green countries are the external countries, so all those are the borders that Frontex is concerned about. And uh, so these data are, are pretty rich, so you, by month, since 2009, we know how many individuals were detected crossing the borders, which is uh, by, and we know the country of origin and the route of entry. And we have several routes of entries, the, the Western African, Western Mediterranean, Central Mediterranean, which is the the route that goes from basically from uh, which well, you, uh, in Malta you know very well, as well as in Italy, and um, so from Libya to and Tunisia to to towards Malta and uh, Italy, and um, Eastern Mediterranean from Turkey basically to, into Greece and the Western Balkan and the Eastern land borders. Okay, so we 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 can observe them, and what we see we so so this uh, this graph shows the, the evolution from 2009 to 2018 so the 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 black line is the number of crossing which i showed to you in the, i think in the, my second slides with this peak which was pretty impressive so this is the, the the number of illegal crossing were were went was something like 1.7 million in 2015 and then dropped dramatically following uh, after the u turkey deal and then this uh, blue these bars these color bars give give a sense of how much variation we have in terms of the distribution of crossing from uh, between routes okay so there is plenty of variation that we are which we are interested to explore so the central mediterranean was was a uh, was crucial in some years, like 2014, but was not in 2015, for instance. And uh, and the, while the East Mediterranean and the Western Balkan and uh, prevailed. Okay, so variation across routes of entry. And um, and who are these people? So let me just clarify this. And uh, so it, are they refugees or undocumented immigrants? And by undocumented immigrants, we, there is this distinction between someone who is uh, um, uh, fleeing uh, a conflict and someone who is. Uh, migrating, so someone is forced, who is forced to migrate by by conflict and persecution, or, or economic migrants, someone who is uh, who is uh, who is not really forced to migrate, but decides to migrate uh, to 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 look for a better life. Then we can discuss whether poverty is is an equally um, strong push factor as as conflict. So what do we have? We have a mix, and this, I, in my opinion, I'm happy to, to discuss that. In my opinion, I mean the fact that refugees and documented migrants, probably it's not just my opinion, uh, get get mixed while trying to, to reach Europe uh, is is a part of the complexity. Okay, because clearly asylum seekers have a, a right to, to 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 arrive in a safe country, uh, are entitled to to get there, even if they are not entitled to enter legally, and but then once they are there, they can apply for asylum, and there is a, a a consensus about granting them the, the right to do so. The same, while the opposite, the same is not true for economic migrants who don't have really have an entitlement, but, but can be allowed or not to enter by destination countries. So the issue in Europe is clearly that 
Asylum seekers must physically arrive in the territory of the host countries in order to claim refugee status. And there is this contradiction between the fact that they are entitled to apply for asylum if they get to, to the destination countries, but they are not allowed to enter legally in the destination countries. So they have to go through uh, well, the same smuggling roads that, uh, that uh, economic migrants use. And, um, and indeed, if you look at the nationalities, we see a, a mix. So the first 15 nationalities over this period are, are a mix of countries which are clearly in conflict, uh, Syria is the first one, but also countries which are clearly not, in, where there is no conflict. I, I will pick on uh, Albania, for instance. And the evolution of, uh, the, again, there was plenty of variation in terms of uh, nationalities over the time. So with, uh, clearly here in this graph is very well visible that the onset of the conflict in Syria in 2000. 11, 2012, after the Arab Spring, and then Syria becoming a major, so the blue bar uh, becoming a major part of the flows, but while before they were non-existent, where no Syrian were, were migrating before. And then, and then changes with Afghanistan being always there, Albania being prevalent before, when the flows were much lower, and then tending to, to vanish in uh, afterwards, and uh, in terms of share. Okay. So plenty of variation and um, and uh, in variation in the composition, as you can see in 2015, this, this three, these five nationalities accounted for more than 80% of the overall flows, so they were dominated by Syrians and Afghanistan. And, uh, but in other years, they account only for, for instance, 2011, they accounted only for something like 35%. So all other nationalities accounted for the remaining 65%. Okay, so this will be our outcome. So we will use this as a measure of the illegal, undocumented migratory pressure into to Europe, and then we we will then we need to measure, which is also a challenge to measure from a data point of view, measure border enforcement. So what we did, we we collected data from uh, from Frontex um, on the joint operation Frontex runs, and what are the this joint operation are basically the let's say the, the main role of Frontex is really the, the, the of coordinating and deploying additional officers. As we said, so each individual member country has run its own border operations at, the, at, the, at its borders and uh, patrolling for, for migrants, for smuggling, for drug smuggling and all this. But then in addition, Frontex may uh, add this so-called joint operation. So basically by, by coordinating the effort of different EU, EU countries, the Frontex is then contributing with basically additional office, uh, officers, experts, technical equipment, and, and coordinating these efforts at the, at the external, again, external EU borders. So we have a large number of operations we look at. The majority of them are, are return operations, so basically um, European member countries coordinate in, in, in deporting, in sending back to origin countries migrants who have been apprehended for being illegal, illegally resident in, uh, in the European Union. But we focus on something like a, so a set of like uh, about 90 operations, which are land and sea operations. And we measure, we develop three indicators of whether uh, we, we, there, we, there, is a, there was an operation active. So our unit of observation will be we will look at route level, and so we know where they cross, and uh, we know where the month and the quarter when this crossing is observed. So we will match those uh, observation with. So we will basically establish in each month, in each on each route, we will uh, establish. We we know uh, which what is the number of active operation in that month or that quarter on that route. What is the total budget spent by Frontex on that route on that month or quarter? And also we, we can count as another measure of intensity of, of this presence, uh, the total number of days of active operation in a given month or given quarter. Okay, maybe if there is just an operation which lasts for two, for the initial two days of the month, that counts as, as a two. If there are two operations running for in the same month, we count them as 60 days in one month. So, so just a measure of intensity of of effort in uh, in that span of time. I will skip completely. So there is a we have. I mean, for, for those who are interested in this uh, and are, are familiar with this literature, we use a random mutated model. So uh, the, the, very simply, in words, so there is a migrants who wants to move, move to migrants who come from multiple source countries, which is the setting we have, and they want to go to one single destination country, which is the European Union. We don't distinguish the, the destination because we don't observe that in the data. And the choice is about whether to migrate to European Union, first of all, and then 
how to how how to get there, and there are multiple routes of entry. Okay, and the markets will decide depending clearly there are characteristics of the route like the distance which matter, distance from yeah, the origin country which matters, and then um, the riskiness of the route and uh, and clearly the level of enforcement on the route. And this from this model we we directly derive an estimating equation. Again, I will these are I've got like a couple of slides which are pretty intensive in terms of econometrics. Then I, let me go quickly on them. And then, um, but then basically, what we do, we we simply we explain the number of uh, of illegal crossings, the the log of it from country through through the route R in, from country C in time T, and we want to see how much the enforcement, so this red variable here, so this beta, how much the enforcement affect these crossings, and then we have all the battery of fixed effects. So this is basically for this familiar is it's very similar to a, it's a gravity model if you want to grab the equation. And um, for those familiar with the international trade literature, and uh, and we absorb a number of factors with fixed effects. So we have we we control for root country. So these are dyadic fixed effects. We, for instance, control for um, the distance between a country. So each country will have a most preferred route to to cross, and uh, simply because the, that route is the the one which is closer. So like for Syrians, clearly the the best route was going into Turkey and then crossing through through Greece, so the Eastern Mediterranean, clearly not the Western Mediterranean, which goes from, from Morocco to Spain. So this is captured here. We control for country and, and T, so uh, any shock in the origin country, so like the ongoing conflict in Syria is absorbed in the fixed effect, and then we control for seasonality at the root level because the risk of crossing a certain route varies with season. So. Again, a little bit of econometrics very quickly. So issues we have, we have issues of measurement everywhere. As I said before, the main one in this literature is really that you don't observe the underlying flows. You observe only the detected crossings. So those who are, which are basically detected by the police enforcement. And this creates a positive correlation between. Clearly, if you deploy more controls, you will detect more people. Possibly, so this is why you observe, tend to observe any data, so a, cor a positive correlation between the two things, which doesn't mean that the enforcement is, is pointless, maybe the enforcement is deterring uh, people from, from crossing, but it's also detecting more of those who cross, and therefore it's, it's, it will be unclear what you observe, okay? And then the indigenous of enforcement, so this is, uh, again, uh, let me refer back to the literature on police and crime, probably you are aware that if you look at the data, you tend to observe that um, then you, you, you see more police in areas where there is more crime. And clearly this doesn't mean the police is causing crime, it means the opposite. It means that given there is more crime in a certain area, then clearly the police forces deploy more police officers, more patrolling in that area. And so, and this is what we call reverse causality. So it's, it's crime which is attracting more, more police and not police causing more crime, clearly. And um, so here is the same thing. So basically, the, the, exactly the way Frontex works and the way any any uh, country thinking about border enforcement works is that you you try to predict where the, the major flows will come from and when, and then you deploy more forces there. Okay. So we all know that in the Central Mediterranean, clearly, whenever the weather improves and especially in spring and summer, we know that there will be more crossings, and that's the the, the point of time where you want to deploy more, for instance, search and rescue operation or, or border control. So this is, a, is an exact, another example of reverse causality. So it's, it's actually the expected flows which determine the enforcement. And so we may, if you look at the data, we, we may simply observe that whenever we have more, more inflows, we also have more enforcement, okay, which, which would suggest that enforcement is, is not effective because it's, you have more crossings and more enforcement. And uh, but 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 the problem is that the, the the direction of causality goes from from crossing to enforcement. So what you want, which is uh, what we do, is uh, this instrumental variable strategy, which is, the idea is simply that we want to use shocks to enforcement. So the problem is that the enforcement increases when when uh, Europe expect more crossings to 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 come, and therefore you tend to find this positive correlation. Why you would expect if uh, enforcement is effective. To, to reduce crossing, you would have observe these two variables to be negatively correlated. You increase enforcement, you, redu you reduce, you observe a reduction in crossings. So what we do, we basically use instrumental variable strategy, which the idea behind that is that if we could find some, some shocks to enforcement, some, some other factors which determine changes in enforcement across routes, which are not determined by expected flows, 
we can break this reverse causality issue and basically change enforcement uh, exogenously and uh, and then look at the effect on uh, on uh, on crossings so this is the idea and and so the first part of my of my results will be about evidence of political cycle and then we will use that as an instrument in the second half of, of my results so the first uh, evidence we provide so we so we were thinking about how this uh, the, the decision are made at the European Union level and clearly we we look at this uh, the fact that we, as you as you know that the council of the European Union rotates across member countries the presidents of it, of it and um, and this rotation is predetermined and every six months and uh, and the council of the European Union is one of the main decision making body in uh, in uh, the European Union responsible for the European budget and there is quite consensus about political scientists that like I'm, I'm quoting one of them the office of the council presidency offers its holder a privileged opportunity to shape the EU policy agenda in accordance with national interests and so the and there is empirical evidence that holds allows member countries to influence the budget in the future but also its allocation today and uh, so the question we had is simply that. So if suppose Italy gets the presidency, and clearly Italy has a strong interest in, uh, as we said before, if you if Italy is not, and I'm not assuming that, I'm just suggesting that maybe Italy, rather than having a, a European Union wide perspective, Italy may be more self interest and, and just think about the central Mediterranean route and caring less about what happens in other routes because those other routes will affect other member countries. I'm just, I'm not claiming that this is the case. I would say it is, but it's my humble opinion. So if there is this kind of like individu individualistic tension within the European Union, then any country who gets the presidency may try to affect, may try to influence the allocation, uh, the budget allocation to towards routes which are closest to, geographically closer to, to them. And this is what we what we do. So we, we, we basically use this variation, this rotation of the presidency. Let me use a graph to, to give the idea. So this graph is, is showing the three uh, consecutive presidency, which are predetermined, as you know, using the alphabetical uh, order of the names in the uh, um, uh, native language. Ireland, Lithuania, and Greece. Okay. So and what and these arrows basically show the distance from the the, uh, the starting point that we picked on the map of each route we, we consider uh, and uh, the distance between each route and the current presidency. Okay, and this uh, clearly this rotation makes that this distance vary over time. Okay, so a route may happen to be very far from, from uh, the current EU presidency in one semester and the next semester may happen to be very close, for instance, because the the, the the presidency moves from Lithuania to Greece. Okay, we explain this variation. The question is basically from the point of view of a route, do you observe more enforcement uh, if uh, if the route is is uh, is closer to the current presidency of the European Union? And the idea would be that if if we do, this suggests that the, the current presidency has some uh, uh, bargaining power in in shifting the decision of how to allocate the, the budget across different routes in terms of enforcement. Or maybe also at the European Union level, there is a, a, a consensus of, of granting more uh, protection in terms of border controls to current EU member countries because the EU member countries in that semester represent uh, um, Europe on an international global um, uh, arena. And um, so, and this is exactly the idea we're looking for. So, some changes in uh, clearly these changes in uh, this rotation of the presidency has nothing to do with what's happening today in terms of migration flows. And so, this will shift if this is true. And I will clearly, if I'm presenting that, we will find evidence for that. If this is true, this is creating a change in enforcement which has nothing to do with predicted flows. So, so what I'm saying is that if um, if um, uh, some, there may be more enforcement uh, in route in the Eastern Mediterranean route, which are closer to to Greece, because Greece got the presidency, not because they're expecting more flows to to come there. And uh, what we find again is not specific. Let me just say a caveat: it's not specific to any country. So this is something a pattern we find in the data for a long period of time. And so we so this negative coefficient here for all the measures we we built. Um, is, uh, is suggesting that the farther away from the point of view of a route you are from the current residency, this, the, the less enforcement you have, okay, which is the opposite, which is the same thing as saying that the closer you are 
the more enforcement you you have. So this is pretty strong and, sta and stable, no matter whether you change the period of time, fixed effect, different measures, and the magnitude is sizable. And, uh, and actually, we also find that this effect is stronger for countries which are at external borders, uh, like Italy, Spain, Greece, and Malta. And uh, then we bring together in this political economy, so we have shown that there seems to be variation in enforcement which have to do with the European level cycle, um, with the six semester rotation of the presidency, but also there is a national political cycle in terms of elections, and we, there is already literature showing that when you have incoming elections in, uh, in member countries, uh, there, is, there seems to be more allocation of EU budget towards those countries, and especially if they have larger shared euro skeptics. So this is the idea that European Union tend to, and I mean, I, I work in, in the UK, so clearly there is a reason why you, you want to invest more in some countries to, to basically to think about the survival itself of the European Union. So you may want to spend more money uh, to, in countries where, with incoming elections, especially if there are larger share of euro skeptics. And uh, so the question here is, do we observe more enforcement or rules that lead to countries with incoming national elections? So do we observe, if Italy has an incoming election next uh, in the next quarter, do we observe more enforcement there, and uh, which prevents aiming at preventing an, uh, an illegal migrant shock, which may shift voting towards populistic parties or uh, extreme right-wing and populistic parties. And so we use that as a, we, we studied that, and this, sorry, this, this table, these positive coefficients in the in the odd columns suggest that this is what we find. So we find that if you if a route leads to countries where there are incoming elections, you do see more more enforcement. Okay, and if we use the two measures separate together, so our election uh, variable, our distance from the current EU presidency, they both work separately with opposite coefficient, which means again that. From the root point of view, if you're farther away from the current EU presidency, you receive less border enforcement. If you are closer, if you lead to, if you're closer to countries which are where there are incoming election, then you 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 get more border enforcement. Okay, so again, we, we found two variables which affect enforcement, and uh, and we show evidence that enforcement at the European level reacts to that. Then we go to the central question, so uh, section two, border enforcement and crossings, and. Um, and now we, again, as I said, we really, I'm estimating the equation I showed before, so we try to see whether increasing border enforcement affects crossings or not, okay? As I said, this is a, is a, is a trivial question, but it's, I think it's, it's a very important policy evaluation question because we really would like to see, first of all, what is the effect, how big it is, and whether is, is, it, is this the same for, uh, for instance, land and sea route, is it the same for uh, migrants coming from refugee countries or no refugee countries, and uh, and even more so, is there evidence of diversion? So if I enforce on one route, do I get people crossing to another route? And then this is clearly, again, from a point of view of the European Union, this is just uh, suboptimal. Clearly. If you are spending money to prevent migrants to enter one country, you don't want them to enter another uh, member country. So that's not the point of the, that should not be the point of uh, of, of, of the of the action of the European Union level. So what we find is basically, I'm showing here, I'm using, I mean, um, for those familiar with, uh, with the instrumental variable technique, I'm using this, uh, this variation of the policy, uh, this political variation in enforcement, as I said before. So these are, this political cycle creates shocks to enforcement, which have, are uncorrelated with the uh, expected flow. So allows me to, to, to find a causal estimate of, uh, if you believe in instrumental variable techniques, um, uh, of the enforcement on the crossings. And this is what we find. So these negative coefficients here, and uh, this is the reduced form, I will not discuss it, but this negative coefficient suggests that if you, um, and more easily to, more straightforward to, to convey the message, this, all these negative uh, bars uh, suggest that if you increase uh, border enforcement, you do reduce crossing, okay, once you take into account the endogeneity of, by using this political cycle instrument. The effect is there, so border enforcement is, is, uh, is effective, and you, again, this is not a surprising result if you want, but as I said, it has not been uh, provided in this form in the literature yet, if not for the U.S., and also what we find is also that the effect is there for both land routes and sea routes because it, well, yeah, Malta knows it very well, so, so clearly the, the type of enforcement is very different. So on land routes, you can basically deploy the, the army or, or, or the police on the, on the land and just hold, hold the line. On, on, in the sea, clearly the, 
the, the distinction between patrolling the sea and search and rescue operation and all the complexity of it may make the effect less obvious. What we find is that in both cases, we find a negative effect. As you can see, these are the confidence intervals. So, so the sea routes, are, the effect is not statistically different from zero, but the, the magnitude of it is, is, is comparable to land routes for two indicators out of, out of three. And uh, so it's more imprecise, but we, 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 with such a, we tend to conclude that there is an effect there as well. We have a number of robustness checks, as we should do, and uh, testing with our uh, two IVs separated together, the timing of it, and excluding the peak, we leave out one country at a time, we change the set of source countries, we aggregate regression, we deal with the clustering of stand there, and, uh, and everything is very, is very robust to that. And um, then we, clearly we, we ask the question, so we should, as a kind of like, try to understand more our results, we, we clearly, we have, as we said before, we have, people crossing this in these migrants, these uh, foreign-born individuals are, some of them come from clearly uh, countries which are clearly in conflict, and some of them don't. Okay, so what do we expect? We expect that clearly if you are an economic migrant, you, are, you really want to migrate to Europe, but you can also wait. Okay, if there is more enforcement, you may decide to postpone your crossing or to give up if, if it gets too difficult, because the, I mean, really the motivation you have come from the, the desire to improve your life, but you don't have a conflict pushing you out of, uh, of your house. And um, so clearly for, for the refugees, we have stronger push factors, so we would expect them to be less, uh, less elastic, less responsive to, to, to border enforcement. And we would expect the economic migrants to react more, because, basically because they can wait. And, um, and so we, we can distinguish at the individual level who is a refugee, who is an economy migrant. What we can do is really distinguish at the country level, if they come from countries which are experienced conflict or not. And, uh, and this is what we do. And we have variation because, for instance, Syria in our sample, in our sample, you know, the span of time we observe, at first, in the first year, was not a conflict country until 2011 and then became one. So we have uh, time variation in that. And uh, we have two measures of, to, ass to, assign, to assess whether they are in conflict or not. What we find is that, so in, with both measures we use and alternative measures, that the effect is comes. I mean, the deterrence effect comes from uh, econo from economic migrants. So our refugees there, there is very little. Actually, there is no effect, and which doesn't mean that this is not forcing them to to, to basically has no consequences for them. But we what we see, which is confirms the credibility of our results is that the enforcement tend to deter economic migrants more, much more than, uh, than it does on the refugees. And then in the last four or five minutes, if I'm correct, so I will move to the last phase of, uh, of EU border enforcement, which has to do with outsourcing. So this is a, it's not a new idea. So this has been done by, for instance, Spain and Italy before. So Italy had a, an agreement with Libya, which dates back to to, well, I don't remember the year exactly, but has been an ongoing collaboration, Spain as well with the Moroccan government. But basically the idea was that, well, at the peak of the refugee crisis, that there was this idea of trying to convince Turkey to step in, and clearly the, the deal uh, was basically giving money and giving promises of, of for instance, the, 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 the uh, opening the access to Turkish citizens, promises which have not materialized, and also the, the whole deal uh, recently has, has has become like much, much weaker. But the idea at the time was basically, yeah, we asked Turkey to step in. So what we can do with the, we can look at two things which are very important. The first one is whether there was deterrence. So was the EU-Turkey deal effective or not? And we kind of know, already know the answer because we saw that peak in 2015 and then dropping dramatically immediately after. But then the, the most important question is about diversion. Okay, so, and, and this is very important for the European Union. So if you, was this deal effective in uh, in deterring, in stopping the entry of the Eastern Mediterranean? And the answer is yes, and I will show you more evidence now. But also the, the, the following question is, is, did this deal divert flows from the center, from the Eastern Mediterranean towards the Central Mediterranean, meaning towards Malta and Italy? And I will show you evidence that this has also happened. So this is the graph. So this is the total crossings on the East Mediterranean and the Central Med, okay? So note that the scale is different, okay? so the East Mediterranean has a scale which is one order of magnitude, 10 times larger than the Central Med, okay, and the numbers are here as well. But what you see here is clearly on the east, on the left um, panel, there was this dramatic drop, okay, so of the, of the crossing of the East Mediterranean, which basically goes to zero after the, 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 the deal. So this, the deal was effective, as we know, so it still really stemmed the flow. 
And what happened to the central merit? We saw a sudden increase. Okay. And uh, is this a justice of diversion? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Why not? So it may be that at the same time with the deal, there was some event at the, in African countries which led to more migration from Africa, for instance, for whatever reason which I ignore. Okay. So what we can do, we can look at whether we see more Asian uh, migrants crossing at the central Mediterranean. Clearly, for Asian, the central Mediterranean uh, route is not the most obvious one because it's farther away. So we want to see whether do we see more Asian crossing on the, on the central Mediterranean route after the deal. And then the other concern is that clearly the deal was, was signed in, uh, in March. So this effect coincides with April, May and June. And, and then the summer, which is basically is the improvement in uh, weather conditions. So this peak in, uh, in crossing after the deal may be driven by seasonality, okay? Just because the weather improves, it's easier to cross the central Mediterranean, so you have more crossings. So we want to remove that seasonality as well. So what we do, we, do, we deal with that in a difference and difference approach using crossing in previous years. So in all years, um, uh, we may observe this peak and we, we want to remove that. So we estimate a difference and difference uh, equation. I, I, I will fly on that. Let me go straight, also because I have one minute left, I think, and uh, one minute. And uh, so let me go to the results just to, and let me explain them without explaining the, the equation. So what we, so we first look at the Eastern Mediterranean and we look at Asian countries, so the first three columns, and African countries, the other, the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth column. And uh, what we find is negative, coefficient on the post 2016. So basically this is the, what basically tells us what happened in the period from April to September in 2016. This negative coefficient is simply saying what that graph, that massive drop showed. So after uh, um, March 2016, you observe a huge drop in crossings from both Asian and African countries crossing at the East Mediterranean route. Okay, so this way is, is, is in the graph. But let's give to some, some more information. So let's look now at the central Mediterranean, again, the route which, well, which goes through Malta and comes to, to, to Italy. So what we see, we see, is, I mean, this post, uh, this, that means this positive coefficient significant tells us that in, in every year we observe, and here we change the, 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 the span of time we look at from 2012 or from 2014, in every year you do have an increase in crossings from April to September, which is what we call post. And so basically over the summer, which is driven by seasonality. Yeah, I'm done. And uh, so you do have this increase, but in the post, in the summer of 2016, you had an additional increase of Asian migrants crossing in the central Mediterranean, and you don't observe the same for African countries. So if anything, the, in the post-2016, so after the deal was, uh, was signed, you had less migration through the central Mediterranean of Africans, which potentially were displaced by the arrival of Asian uh, refugees, like the Syrians one, who have more, this is documented in like anecdotal evidence and uh, newspaper evidence, they have more purchasing power to, to, for, for the smugglers, because they're wealthier. The average senior refugees, despite the, the, the dire condition they live in, is relatively wealthier than, than the average African migrant. So what we see here is clearly is, we read this as evidence of diversion. So, so the closure of, of, one, of one route divert flows towards another, which we argue is, is clearly not an optimal choice from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the European Union level. Clearly from individual countries, this basically means that uh, relieving Greece from the inflow of refugees has added some, um, some problems to Malta and, uh, and Italy. And I will, uh, so I, I think I will skip on the conclusion because it's just a summary of, um, of what we, we discussed and I really, so I will thank you again for, for the attention and I, um, I'm i done with it, sorry, let me stop sharing. And then we give back the, the floor to Vanessa. Francesco, absolutely fascinating. So as you've heard uh, Sandro, uh, from the, the research that was done, there are a number of very interesting takeaways from that, which uh, I hope there will be some questions. So once again, may I remind you, you can either send a question in the chat or just raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Uh, what uh, your research looked at to summarize was that out of the 79.5 million displaced, um, 
68% came from five countries. So if you would permit me, Francesco, while we're waiting for the first question, one of the things you said was that maybe, you know, if we're only looking at conflicts in five countries, maybe we should tackle that. That's actually quite a political statement. How on earth would you tackle the conflict in those countries to reduce them? Um, and also one of the other things that perhaps I would, would ask is you are looking a great deal at in the role of enforcement. However, when you compare the authorized flows of migrants to the irregular flows of my migrants, how does that work? One of the things I always used to ask as a journalist was many of the, the people who the, these undocumented migrants, whatever you want to call them, who do end up in, in Europe are actually needed to keep the economy going. So is that perhaps are we trying to stop them coming rather than give them a legal way to come? Um, don't forget I'm not an economist, so <laughs> please excuse me if my questions are nonsense. Shall I answer? Yeah, sure. yeah. So yeah, not really. I mean, I, I just, I mean, the question of the conflict is a point well taken. I, if I have to be honest, I have no clue. But and uh, <laughs> and but I was just making the point that clearly, I mean, the, the whole, I mean, much of the refugee, uh, the discourse about refugees is is very often. I mean, this has been a constant. So you have what happens with refugees. You have flows of refugees which are predictable. So we all knew, we all could see what was happening in Syria in the same way that we all can see what happened in Venezuela. And so highly predictable, highly concentrated in our former Yugoslavia in, uh, in the 90s. So, so these are flows of Rwanda, or these are episodes that we can see and we can see the flows coming. And uh, so either we can, we could think of, uh, I mean, my, my, my point was more about the, the fact that there was always this, uh, this, uh, this discourse, which is really much about an emergency that no one could think about, or something like uh, kind of a surprise, and then countries have to react in an emergency, and, and it's not really true. So these are conflicts which are starting and can be observed, and then the fact that they will lead to flows that is very highly predictable, and we know where they are, we know where they come from. So possibly we, I'm just calling, I think, for an earlier intervention, maybe clearly preventing the conflict or, or, or stopping the conflict is complex, and clearly. The serious example is also an example where, I mean, clearly there are political interests that maybe they don't want to stop the conflict. I, I, this I don't know, but clearly we, we could have thought more about how to deal with that because we, we saw it coming rather than uh, all of a sudden discovering that and then rushing through uh, partial solutions, and uh, which is very much the case, what well, well, very, very often happens. And, uh, and the second question is, yeah, so, so there is, a, so I think it's a question about whether these legal and illegal pathways to, 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 to Europe are kind of substitute. Could we reduce the, the legal entry by opening more the, the legal entries? And uh, I think, I mean, there is a, an intense debate on this, but clearly my, my take on this is, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. So we, so clearly, it, it, refugees is, is, is one thing, but economic migrants, so people looking for improving, for working opportunities is, is a possibility, is, a, is something that we, can be managed. And um, and uh, and offering legal opportunities is a way of uh, of uh, of doing that. And and there is evidence, for instance, for the U.S. Uh, where basically by reducing by halting so with, with the end of the Brasero program in the U.S. in the 60s, which was basically a way of attracting legally uh, workforce from Mexico. With the end of that, you you started having um, um, illegal migration because clearly the the demand for uh, the, the Mexican workforce was unchanged by the policy. So clearly, they, 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 the, the farmers in, uh, in the U.S. needed the, the Mexican workers. So if you close the legal way, the, the legal way starts, unless you really deploy the army along the border. So clearly, think about more creatively about legal ways of entry is a way. And, uh, and also think about the, another aspect which is very well documented by the, the, the academic research is, is the fact that migrants do return home. They go back. So there is always this idea in, in the, the public discourse that migrants come and stay forever, and it's, it's just not true. And uh, so if you open legal ways, they may just stay for a while, uh, legal temporary ways, and then they may return. So it doesn't mean that by opening legal ways, you you necessarily get, get in, like using this kind of like jargon, like you get invaded or flooded. And uh, so it, it doesn't have to be the case. And actually, legal ways may facilitate the return much more than having. Uh, people illegally who, who 
then don't go back because they cannot go back legally and uh, to, the, to the country. And there's also evidence of, of that. So for, for, again, for the U.S. showing that if you increase border enforcement, if you make it harder to leave the country, you basically get more undocumented migrants in uh, because they don't leave. And uh, so, yeah, there's lots of complexity in that. But yeah, I mean, so my answer, my take on this debate is, uh, is that yeah, opening legal ways, think about legal ways is a, is a better way to, to deal with the issue. Uh, one of the other points that you also made, which I thought was very interesting, was the, the diversion effect. But hold on a moment, we've got a, a question from uh, Sandro. Sandro, would you like to take over? Thank you. Thank you, um, Vanessa. Uh, uh, Francesco, um, in, your in your paper and during your presentation, you, you draw a parallel between crime and migration in the sense that in the case of crime, um, uh, Basically, we know that the main deterrent, um, although uh, it's not uh, sufficient, is the probability of getting caught, meaning having police around. And of course, with that, uh, you have to have um, uh, a, a penalty which is binding, because you can, you, if the probability of getting caught is very high, but you don't have any penalties, then you don't care if you get caught or not. Now, in the case of migration, I mean, um, is the border control uh, uh, a sufficient deterrent? I mean, um, and 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 where would it be a sufficient deterrent if you have border control at the host country or at the exit country? Because at the host country, I mean, you in the case of refugees, you know, there are international obligations which you cannot send back. So if you get caught as a refugee, you have no problem. You don't have a deterrent. You don't have, a, sorry, a penalty. Um, and in the case of, of, of economic um, as we well know, um, uh, they they you know they are usually travel without documents, uh, so that you know you cannot really identify from which country they are coming from, um, in the hope that you know if they get uh, if they manage to cross the border, um, uh, you know then they cannot be sent back. This is perhaps mostly applicable, you know, where you have um, 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 uh, crossings over the sea. Maybe uh, that's a bit different from crossings over the land, especially if, if, if they're not going to a third country. But I, I, I wanted to ask your opinion whether uh, the, the deterrent would be border controls at the, ho at the host country or at the uh, exit point, uh, because I think that's where it is perhaps more effective, really. Yes, no, absolutely. Is uh, I, I fully agree. So, so really, it's clear that so as you say, for for refugees get being caught, maybe actually, um, um, if you want to, in the in the dire situation they live in, it is a positive outcome because they can finally uh, file an asylum application and in a, in a safe place. For illegal migrants, yeah, it's clearly that, it's, and this is clear. So whenever you if you are in host countries and you are planned uh, undocumented migrants, then you have to pay the cost of, of sending them back to, to the origin country. That, as you say, is, 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 made, is made even more complicated by some, in some, in some instances by migrants' behavior who don't declare the, the, the country of origin, but also by, by the fact that it's very costly to send them back because you have to detain them, you have to identify them, you need to, to have an agreement with the, with the source country, and you need to actually pay for, for them to be repatriated. And uh, so that's a, that's a cost. And clearly, if you, if you shift that to, towards, as it has been done, towards uh, transit countries, then the, the, the deterrence becomes much more effective because clearly, I mean, this is, this is evident because if you, if you ask Turkey to do that, and um, or, or, or Libya even, even more, clearly all this uh, um, legal and moral obligation that we feel we have as a European countries don't, don't apply any, any longer. So we, we certainly save money on that. And uh, but which I agree, and they, and they did. I mean, the deterrence effect with the EU Turkey deal was was striking. The way and uh, from the point of view of migrants, really being stopped in Turkey rather than being stopped in Greece make a huge difference, or in Malta or in Egypt, because really one thing is being inside the European Union, even if apprehended as undocumented, with the hope that you will never be deported and uh, and granted legal status sooner or later. One thing is if you are stopped in, in Turkey and even worse in Libya. So the deterrence effects work. So, uh, I would point to the fact that there is a cost of, of outsourcing as well, which is, a, I would say, both a political cost of, of, of signing deals with, uh, with, uh, with countries like Libya, and um, there is a, well, there are ethical issues, humanitarian issues, which are, are to be discussed and kept into perspective. So, really, 
I mean, I mean, the, the deal with Turkey is, uh, has some political aspects which have to do with uh, with the fact that that whenever there is a attrition on any issues between Turkey and the European Union, this deal becomes uh, uh, gives uh, well at the moment to to to, to Erdogan an upper hand in the debate with the European Union. So this is a cost that we should th think whether we, we would we rather prefer to pay for the deportation of documented migrants or or outsource the, the border control. So I, I, I don't know, it's an open question. It depends on how we bring in economics and po politics and, uh, and ethics as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have a question from our chief economist, Aaron Gregg. Aaron, over to you. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, thank you, Francesco, for the very uh, good presentation. Um, uh, the results are intuitive, so uh, that's always good <laughs> when the results are intuitive. Um, however, I wanted to ask um, uh, whether you considered putting some control variables um, uh, in the sense that uh, it could be that sometimes the diversion is not because of um, the enforcement, but it could be because of conditions uh, in the uh, destination uh, country, for example, if in Libya, uh, there was a open warfare. It might have been difficult for a uh, diversion to happen through Libya. Um, could it be that the agreement coincided with a period when the Libyan situation was relatively calm and therefore they could go through Libya? Um, so I think it would be interesting to see if you could introduce uh, some control variable uh, in that sense. Um, and uh, th that I think would be uh, fairly um, uh, obvious for things like the Syrian uh, migrants, which uh, had the same conditions throughout. Uh, on the economic migrants, I think one issue that you might want to look at is whether um, the, the size of the economic migration also changed during these two periods, in the sense uh, where there are things that would have pushed higher economic migration during a particular year, uh, let's say conditions in Pakistan, economic conditions in Pakistan or in uh, Afghanistan. So just to make sure that uh, the flows are, uh, there is some form of uh, control variable. Um, I don't think that they would change your results that much, but I think it would make the, the conclusion more robust to uh, an academic uh, sense. Thank you. Yes, hi, hi. Thank you very much for for the. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we clearly. So we. I mean, this is an economic answer. So so we. Yeah, we control for anything which varies at the house, at the source country level, by having source country uh, month or quarter fixed effects in the specification. But it's true that any change uh, in transit countries, like the, the example you were making which may correlate with our events at the root level, then this is not uh, taking into account in the in the latter part of the analysis. It's taking it into account in the in the in the central part because we our IV should be also orthogonal to any variation in transit countries. But but I, I agree that we, we for instance in the, the last example with the EU Turkey deal we need to 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 introduce some controls at the Libyan level. And uh, and they need to think more about the economic and refugee migration clearly I mean, the only way we distinguish it is based on, again, it's not based on individual claims, but are whether countries are have ongoing conflict or not. And uh, and uh, again, part of that is captured by this uh, this fixed effect. By and yeah, we need to think more. And we, I mean, we have more in the paper actually than I presented. And uh, just another um, additional point, if I if I'm allowed, um, on the. Uh, data aspect of it. Is there um, any information on the actual capacity uh, for uh, assisting th this migration? For instance, um, is there a way to calculate or to find information on whether, I don't know, there is a, an additional amount of resources in the host country, for example, in Turkey or in Libya, that's being devoted to aid uh, illegal migration. Uh, I know it's an informal part of the economy, and it's uh, it's definitely not not that easy to measure that. But that would also probably explain some of the changes in the levels 
of uh, of migrants because of course if the libyans are uh, devoting more of their economy to to uh, uh, these transfers um, of course there will be more uh, transfers there maybe uh, an indication could be the cost of uh, the, the the crossing so th there is some information i think out there on the cost of the crossing and that could give an idea on whether it is uh, there are more boats or there, the, 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 there's more provision uh, and that would help you to explain also the, the flow uh, in general okay yeah on this end yeah i need to think about it, actually so we uh, at the beginning of the project we tried to gather evidence so on uh, yeah on the, we were very interested in the cost of crossing as economists for i mean if you have a price it's about we yeah you, you do find lots of information nothing that in our uh, assessment was useful for for like a serious economic analysis, uh, so enough data with uh, with enough coverage and uh, reliance. And uh, but yeah, we are. I'm actually. I mean, this is part of a broader approach, so a broader research agenda they have on the on the topic. So I'm also have a, a parallel project just where we focus on uh, going back a little bit to actually to to the Libya. So we basically analyze that this only the Central Mediterranean with uh, geolocated data on uh, on both on casualties and uh, actually on SOS. On, on boats in distress in the Mediterranean Sea and following the, the evolution of operation between uh, Libya, Malta and Italy and uh, this, how the, the Libyan Coast Guard stepped in and how the evolution of conflict in Libya affected the departure point of this, uh, of this crossing, bringing all this, uh, this, the conflict in transit countries to in, in that's the main part of this, uh, this other paper where you are more we focus on one route and uh, and I'm actually doing more, more work uh, in uh, in Libya uh, yeah not currently now but but it's uh, I would think about it just like um, for for extensions of, of future research Francesco we've uh, run out of time but it's absolutely fascinating as you as you said so little research has been done and clearly from just what you have presented to us the very important conclusions that need to be drawn before people you know for policymakers and so on thank you very much and now we will ask uh, germano ruizzi if he'd like to start his presentation thank you well, once thank again Francesco. thank you very much again for the invitation it was a great pleasure germano can we Hello, will germano, you be uploading you your own yes i hope you, you can be uploading see it? it let's see whether it uploads properly Second. Okay. There you go. Over to you. Thank you. I'm okay. here. Anything? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anissa, for kind of introducing me and my work. Um, so, okay, the, this work is essentially part of the work I've been doing at the bank over the last uh, over the last year, and uh, if with. Francesco, we talked about migration from a more uh, political point of view, meaning that the effect on policy, of policies on uh, migration flows. Here we take a different uh, standpoint. Here we just look at migration from a, from a pure economic point of view. So essentially what I'm asking myself with this paper is whether the foreign labor supply can be a source of uh, economic fluctuations for the case of Malta, the economy we are uh, in. So um, let me just motivate this work, and uh, I believe that the motivation is quite straightforward because it has to do with uh, what we have seen uh, in Malta in, uh, in, uh, in recent years. Um, so this graph shows the evolution of the uh, foreign labor force, uh, foreign workforce in Malta over the last, uh, over the last years. And uh, what we see is a remarkable increase in the foreign uh, workforce in Malta. If in 2004, at the time of the uh, EU accession of Malta, the number of uh, foreign workers was about 4,000 people, nowadays, I would say, with data up to 2019, we see that the number of foreign workers increased to 67 percent, uh, 67 uh, sorry, thousand people. This is true both for uh, uh, euro area. Uh, foreign nationals, but also for uh, third country nationals, and uh, this is a phenomenon that we have uh, experienced uh, particularly over the last uh, very few years. If we said we look at the percentage of the foreign labor force in Malta, in 2004, again, at the time of uh, when Malta joined the EU, it was just 3% of the people that were uh, 
percent of the workers were uh, uh, foreign. In 2009, uh, one out of uh, four people on the Maltese uh, uh, labor market was foreign. Uh, was a foreign national. So, uh, given this uh, brief motivation, it's, uh, uh, it's quite reasonable to ask ourselves whether foreign labor force uh, can be a source of macroeconomic fluctuations for the for the case of Malta. So uh, that's essentially what I do in this paper. When the main objective is to understand whether foreign labor foreign labor supply shocks can explain the fluctuations of the Maltese economy, and in order to do this, I develop a vector of regression in a structural form in order to identify, in particular, this uh, immigration shock. Now, for the uh, remainder of this presentation. Uh, Foreign labor supply shocks and immigration shocks can be used interchangeably, just because in this paper we are focusing on migrants that come to Malta for work-related reasons, because they want to join the Maltese labor market. That's why uh, the two can be used interchangeably. So if these are the objectives of, the, of this work, the main findings are essentially that the migration shocks uh, generate a positive and persistent impact on uh, real economic activity. At the same time, they increase participation rate and put a downward pressure on employment, which is good for the Maltese case. But at the same time, as a form of labor supply, they produce a downward pressure on uh, real wages. Uh, in addition, other, uh, other results show that uh, immigration shocks can uh, have a positive impact on uh, public finances on major superactivity and uh, not surprisingly also uh, on rents. Um, so, um, before jumping to the uh, main body of the presentation, let me just give you a, a sketch of uh, what the presentation will be, how the presentation is structured. The first part will be devoted to the presentation of the methodology. Then I will show you the results divided by in two parts, the main results of the analysis and then a battery of further experiments on public finances, real estate and productivity, which are the sectors that uh, probably uh, matter the most in our case. And then finally, in a, uh, typically done with a presentation, we'll uh, conclude with uh, some uh, uh, remarks. Um, so, OK. the. The paper is based on a very simple uh, uh, vector regression model estimated in a Bayesian fashion, where our uh, endogenous variables that are meant to be representative of the Maltese labor market are explained by a simple intercept, a linear time trend, and a number of, uh, of lagged values. The um, variables that are meant to be representative of the Maltese labor market, which are at the bottom left of the slide, are a measure of real GDP, real gross domestic product, real wages, the participation rate, the immigrants' share, which is calculated as the stock of immigrants working in the, on the market, divided by the working age population, and the unemployment rate expressed in percentages. Um, so, if, uh, if this is the, uh, the model in, uh, in a reduced form, in order to draw a uh, reasonable uh, structural economic, uh, in order to do a structural economic analysis, we have to resort to a reliable um, identification strategy. In this work, I just use the sun restrictions identification strategy uh, developed recently in a paper by Furlanet and Robstad for the case of, uh, of Norway. And uh, given that I have five endogenous variables in order to fully identify the model, I identify uh, five structural shocks, which are meant to be representative, representative of the possible sources of fluctuations of our economy, and in this particular case of our labor market. So um, three out of these five structural shocks, which are the three in the middle, uh, are meant to be originating in the labor market directly. The first is a wage bargaining shock, which is meant to capture how uh, wage bargaining can be a source of fluctuations in our economy. Then we have two uh, labor supply shocks, a domestic one, which is meant to capture the you can think of it as the influx of uh, Maltese workers into the labor market, looking and willing to, uh, to work, looking for a job and willing to work. The other one is the foreign labor supply shock or immigration shock, which 
captures how the influx of uh, migrants that look for a job or come here directly to work can influence the fluctuations of our economy. The other two shocks, the business cycle shock and the so-called residual shock, are meant to be catch-all shocks just to capture the residual dynamics of the economy and to fully identify the model. In particular, the business cycle shock it can be uh, thought as a shock that tries to identify favorable or unfavorable in the case unfavorable in the case of a negative business cycle shocks, so favorable or unfavorable, uh, let's say, business conditions. Um, okay, for the sake of time, let me just uh, uh, focus on the shock of interest, the immigration shock that here is highlighted in, uh, in red. Uh, let me just tell you how we characterize this immigration shock for, the, for our case. Um, the immigration shock, again, is a form of labor supply shock that implies that foreign nationals come to the Maltese island to, to work or to look for a job. And as such, it is uh, characterized by the impact increase in participation rate and the immigrants' share. But at the same time, as a form of labor supply shock, the shock produces a, a upward pressure on uh, real GDP, but at the same time, it is characterized putting a downwards pressure on real wages on impact. What happens next is completely data-driven. So that's all we need to characterize our immigration shock. So if this is the ident identification of the shock, the, let's have a look at the uh, dynamic responses of our economy to such a shock. In other words, this graph shows the, the impulse response functions. And the, each of these five panels represent the dynamic responses of the five endogenous variables as soon as the immigration shock hits our economy. Um, for simplicity, the shock is normalized to increase the immigrants' share by 1% on impact only. And the, the black dashed lines are the median responses, while the gray shaded areas are the 68% credible bands that you can think of them as a measure of uncertainty around our estimates. So the results are quite straightforward. Given this is a form of a labor supply shock coming from foreign nationals, the impact response of our real GDP on impact and in medium terms is plus 0.6%. The peak response is reached uh, after uh, a few quarters in the medium term, I would say after five quarters we get the peak response of uh, slightly less than 1%. And such a response is persistent and lasts uh, at for around at least four, uh, sorry, four years, almost uh, 15 quarters. So if this is what happens to real GDP, the effect on real wages is the, is the following. We see that uh, on impact, and probably this is influenced by the identification strategy, the real wages uh, uh, decrease on impact by 0.5%. But then in the medium term, we see that uh, there is a significant downwards pressure on wages, which is, like, which is equal to roughly 0.25%. And this is significant, especially for the horizons that go from 8 to 22, roughly 22 quarters after a shock hits. Um, the immigrants' share response is another object of interest. Um, even though it is normalized to increase by 1% on impact, we see that the peak response is reached after a few quarters. So um, this hump-shaped behavior of the immigrants' share response uh, can have an interpretation, and actually it does in the, in the literature. A possibility can be uh, due to phenomenal reunifications that maybe it is not exactly the most important case in Malta, but I would say that probably in our case, this hump-shaped response can be due to a certain network effect, meaning that uh, uh, immigrants tend to follow uh, uh, immigrants uh, that come from the same country of origin, or otherwise uh, we can put it like uh, immigrants prefer to go to a, a country where they know they can find a community of people coming from the same country of origin. Then the last object of interest is the response of the unemployment rate in our economy. Um, the impact response in medium terms is essentially equal to zero. It is surrounded by a certain degree of uh, uncertainty, but as the horizon, the RF horizon grows large, in the medium term we can see that there is a clear and significant downward pressure on uh, unemployment rate that is roughly equal to 
maybe slightly lower than 0.1%. So it means that uh, immigration shocks put downwards pressure on employment rate. And this, in the case of Malta, can be explained by the fact that uh, uh, migrants coming to Malta, either they come directly with a job offer or they're able to find a job soon after the, the, they come to the, to the islands. Um, well, if these are the uh, main results of uh, this, uh, this model, um, I can show you that also these results are quite robust to a small change in identification strategy. In other words, uh, what I was suggesting at the bank is that we can clearly say that uh, on impact we can see an immediate down downwards pressure on, on, uh, on real wages. Uh, simply because wages uh, take time to, to adjust, they are considered to be seeking. And therefore, I replace this uh, negative impact restriction with a zero restriction impact, meaning that, okay, wages might take time to, to adjust, even if there is uh, an immigration shock, if there is uh, an inflow of uh, labor coming from uh, abroad. And the results that now are uh, in, uh, in red show us that uh, the results are essentially unchanged, as the IRFs uh, almost completely overlap with the obvious difference in the impact response of real wages, meaning that even if we uh, assume that our wages take some time to, uh, to adjust, we still see a uh, downwards pressure, at least in the, median, in the medium term, of roughly minus 0.25%. Uh, after an immigration shock hits the, the economy. Okay, if these are the uh, dynamic responses of the other economy after an immigration shock, we can uh, make one step uh, further and we ask ourselves, okay, what are the drivers that make uh, our economy fluctuates? And uh, we can find the answer through the um, forecast relevance decomposition, which is depicted in this, uh, in this slide. Each of these five panels represent the forecast relevance composition associated with uh, each of the five endogenous variables, and the different colors represented the share of forecast error variance can, that can be attributed to the five shocks that we identify. Uh, for those of you that, are, that might not be familiar with this uh, object, uh, you can think of the forecast relevance composition as a uh, measure of uh, what drives what. Uh, for example, in, uh, in this particular case, for the case of Malta, we can see that uh, most of the, uh, the reasons why our variables fluctuate over time can be attributed to the domestic labor supply shock, the immigration shock in purple, and also the business cycle shock. So the two uh, labor supply shocks matter, as well as the uh, business cycle shocks. Um, this is particularly true for the real GDP that, for example, in the, in the long run, uh, the fluctuations in GDP can be mostly explained by the two labor supply shocks and the business cycle shock in, a, in the same measure, around 30 percent. Um, for the sake of time, let me just uh, um, go to the forecast relevance composition of the immigrant share and the unemployment rate. Here in this case, and differently from the real GDP, uh, most of the reasons why these variables, immigrant share and unemployment rate, fluctuate over time is due to um, labor supply shocks, the immigrants and, uh, and domestic labor supply shocks. In the case of the immigrant share, around 50 to 60 percent of the fluctuations can be explained by immigrants, immigration shocks. But also a certain amount of, uh, I mean, it's also important the uh, domestic labor supply shock in explaining the fluctuations of the immigrant share. The way I understand this uh, and a possible interpretation can be that possible shortages in, um, in Malta in terms of local workers can drive the fluctuations of the immigrant share. And obviously at the higher horizons also the state of the business cycle and the shocks of the business cycle can matter to the fluctuations of the immigrant share. Um, finally, as for the unemployment rate, uh, we have again that uh, at least in the long run, 30% uh, of the fluctuations in employment rate are explained by immigration shocks, 30% by domestic labor supply shock and the uh, business cycle shock um, as well. While at very short horizons, most of the fluctuations in unemployment are explained by domestic labor supply shocks, probably because uh, Maltese uh, uh, people have a uh, faster access to the, to the market. That can be a possible reason why we get this result. 
Okay, um, if these are the uh, results that can be drawn from the uh, main uh, model, the uh, what I've done with this work is to uh, analyze also the effect of immigration on other on other sectors. So, and the first of them is the um, the effect on of immigration on uh, public finances. Um, the first row of the slide uh, shows the effect of immigration on uh, government revenues, while the second row focuses on government expenditure. The left column uh, shows the impulsive response functions, again, the dynamic responses of these two variables to an immigration shock, while the right column shows the uh, forecast error runs the composition of these variables. Um, for the sake of time, uh, for the rest of this presentation, we'll focus on the um, on the dynamic responses of these variables, the past responses, and uh, I will devote just a few words for the forecast relevance composition, uh, where we find something that is interesting. Okay, uh, so overall, by having a look at this slide, the result uh, is quite straightforward. Immigration shocks uh, appear to have a, a positive impact on public finances. Um, and this is especially true if you consider the response of government revenues. Um, more precisely, uh, as soon as an immigration shock hits the economy, we see that the uh, government revenues experience an upward pressure in the medium term, which is slightly below 1%, and this response is uh, significant. While, uh, even though we find a peak response, which is uh, slightly below 1% for the government expenditure, this response is not significant throughout the IRF horizon. In other words, an immigration shock seems to uh, push revenues up more than uh, uh, the case of expenditure. Therefore, in net terms, we can see uh, uh, an, Im an improvement in the government balance. Um, um, okay, so if this is what happens with uh, uh, public finances, I move forward to the next uh, sector of interest, which is the real estate. Now, in this case, the first row focuses on uh, house prices, the effect of immigration on uh, house prices, while the second row focuses on, uh, on rents. Okay, what happens when uh, immigration shocks hit the Maltese economy? The response of house prices is uh, hump shaped with a medium term peak response of sl slightly lower than 1%, but as the 68% uh, credible region crosses the zero line, we are not sure about this response. So we are not confident in saying that there is a significant increase in house prices following an immigration shock. A possible reason uh, can be seen in the forecast relevance of the composition that suggests that 60%, uh, um, roughly 60%, of the fluctuations of uh, house prices can be explained by business cycle shocks. So in other words, if you're asking ourselves, okay, what we have seen recently was an increase in uh, house prices. This is mainly due to business cycle conditions and probably immigrants uh, are only a part of the transmission of the business cycle shocks that drives uh, uh, house prices up, more or less, what, which is more or less what we have seen over the recent years. If you have a look at rents, instead the, the results are slightly different. We have a peak response in the medium term, which is slightly below uh, than 1.5%. Uh, the peak response is uh, significant, and now instead immigration shocks play a more relevant role, and they contribute to the fluctuations of the rents uh, in a measure of between 20, 30, 40%. It depends on the horizon of, uh, of interest. Finally, the last uh, and probably the most important of these uh, uh, further exercises is um, the effect of uh, immigration shocks on uh, our measures of uh, our productivity. On the uh, left side of the slide, uh, we have uh, the effect of immigration on labor productivity as a whole, while on the right hand side, uh, we try to decompose labor productivity into TFP and capital intensity. Okay, if we proceed by order, we, uh, we see that immigration shocks produce an upward pressure on labor productivity, meaning that uh, given the sample that we are using, that probably I forgot to mention starts in 2004, 
which is after Malta joined the EU, which is when the influx of uh, uh, foreign workers became an important phenomenon. Given the immigration shock, labor productivity uh, goes up and the response is significant in the medium term. If you try to understand why labor productivity goes up, I would say that most of the uh, reasons why it goes up is because TFP goes up, total factor productivity, uh, meaning that uh, probably uh, local firms in Malta are able to make a more efficient use of the uh, factors production, more efficient use of the resources, in this case labor, and this uh, pushes up the total factor productivity. One of the possible reasons uh, uh, for these results that, are, uh, that I read in the, in the literature can be due to task specialization. For example, uh, native workers might uh, specialize in more com uh, communication intensive tasks, while uh, foreign uh, workers can uh, specialize in uh, more manual intensive tasks. And in this way, we might gain, uh, uh, we might get some uh, gain efficiency gain, and that's why the TFP goes up. So then finally, if on the one hand the TFP um, goes up, the capital in intensity instead, uh, we see a decline in capital intensity with a peak response of in the medium term of minus 0.25%. And this result is quite uh, straightforward, I would say. Uh, given an immigration shock, probably local firms find themselves in a better position to employ more labor. They find an abundance of, uh, of labor. They employ more labor for any given level of capital. And uh, I would say this is particularly true for the case of Malta, which is a services-oriented economy. Um, well, this uh, leads me to the conclusions of this, uh, this work. So essentially, with this uh, work, I developed a set of Bayesian BIRs to disentangle the effects of immigration shocks in the, on the Maltese economy. Again, where the immigration shocks are considered to be foreign labor supply shocks, where migrants come to Malta for work-related reasons. Uh, overall, what we find is that immigration shocks positively affect the GDP, put a downwards pressure on uh, unemployment and lead, as we saw in the previous slide, to higher productivity, which is obviously key for the long run performance and is uh, very important in the context of uh, an aging population. Um, obviously, as you have seen, the approach was uh, purely uh, a macro approach, so that's why I focused on uh, mainly aggregate variables. And uh, definitely, uh, this is a limitation and is also at the same time a possible uh, way to go for further research because this uh, work can be extended uh, along many dimensions if we only had more uh, granular data, possibly sector level data or uh, uh, qualification level data regarding to migrants and, uh, and so on. Um, so, this is all for my hand. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm uh, happy to, to take them. Thank you very much, Germano. So who would like to go first with uh, a question? Yes, sure. There we go, Sandro, over to you. Thank you. Yes, um, more than a question, I, I only would like to make uh, a little comment uh, on this. This is, of course, a uh, very interesting piece of work which uh, Germano has done, um, uh, but uh, it is in a way um, uh, looking at the old world <laughs> now. And I think now going forward, we have to think also about uh, different kinds of migrants in the sense that with the advent of the pandemic, now we have um, um, an increasing penetration of uh, remote working. And reward working will certainly have implications on migration as well, because we know that remote working is not simply doing your job at home, but your home could be a different country as well. So in this case, of course, a migrant who is physically present in Malta would have very different implications than, a, let's say, a migrant who is working from his own uh, home country. So I think going forward, it will be a bit of a challenge, especially, I think, for the National Statistics Office to to, to sort of uh, capture data which distinguishes between these two kinds of, of, of migrants. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, they have to ask employers whether 
their employees are actually uh, working from Malta or, or working from another country, whether they are taxed in Malta or taxed in their home country. I mean, these are all issues which certainly will complicate uh, life in, 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 in such analysis, especially if um, such kind of uh, engagements will become uh, increasingly popular. That, that was just a comment, but uh, it's, it's something which you have to consider going forward, of course, uh, on, on, on building on this analysis. Thank you very much, Sandro. Any other questions? Francesco has a question for you, Germano. Yeah, yeah, no, really, really interesting, nice work. And uh, I was just wondering, because I, I can see that I mean, the, the, if you could embed some information on, uh, on the type of migrants, so like differentiate between labor supply shops of like high skill versus low skill migrants. And because uh, I, I was trying to, I think Malta is a, is a change in pattern. In, uh, so I think the migration to Malta was dominated by highly kind of like U European high skill like British uh, migrants and now has changed a lot and so if you could bring this into 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 what this work and of future work well definitely was one of the things I I wanted to study but at the moment given the uh, I would say lack of data uh, I hold on on uh, hold on on that but definitely is the, in the research agenda because definitely is uh, something very important because I, I believe that in terms of macroeconomic fluctuations probably highly skilled people can contribute more towards fluctuations in the in the economy so definitely is uh, an important question to uh, to address so Germano, in the absence of any other questions, uh, there is more about uh, rents. It was very interesting to see your slide about the fact that the impact it had on house prices and also on rents. I will remind you that there is another um, paper in the research bulletin about rents. May I thank all the audience for attending. Um, it's been a, a fascinating morning. We hope that next year we'll be able to do it in person, so at least we can give you some coffee and biscuits. In the meantime, uh, we will be uploading the research bulletin onto the website at 11.30 and you'll be able to look at all the research in there. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this lecture and you're from outside the bank, to follow us on Facebook. We have Central Bank of Malta events page where we regularly post information about upcoming events and also on LinkedIn. Uh, one of the things that I will point out is that we next event planned for us is December 14th, when we will be having a listening event for anybody who would like to comment and give feedback on the ECB's strategic review. Thank you very much for being with us. And of course, thank you uh, to my communications team, but of course, to our two excellent speakers and to Sandra DeMarco for making this uh, workshop possible. Brian McAuliffe, thanks for putting it all together. I leave you all to go out. Thank goodness we don't have to go back to our cars in the rain. That's pouring at the moment. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, bye. Thanks.